So, 2.2 is quadratic functions. What is a quadratic function? Anybody? Mm. Something with a square in it. That's it. Okay, so this is basically what we're going to be focusing on in this section are just quadratic functions that have squares in them. So we want to be able to recognize characteristics of parabolas, graph parabolas, determine uh, a quadratic function's maximum and minimum, and to solve uh, problems involving uh, quadratic functions, maximums, and minimums. Okay, so we're going to do a few word problems. Well, we're going to do one word problem at the end, uh, but it's an application problem using maximum and minimum. So here we have the standard form of a quadratic equation. f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. Now when we did circles, h and k was an important point, right? It was the center of a circle. For a parabola, it's the vertex. It's the point where we start and go. Okay, so remember, parabolas look like that. Well, that's an awful parabola, but that's the basic shape of a parabola, right? That's one going up. We also have parabolas that go down. So if A, the number in front, is positive, positive is a happy term, right? Makes a smiley face. Those are the ones that go up. If A is a negative, negative, oh, that's a, that's a frowny face. So a negative A means that it's going down. Okay, It's real easy to remember. H and K are our vertex. Okay. A parabola, notice is symmetric. It looks the same on either side of that vertex. So the line x equals h is referred to as the axis of symmetry. It's what we could flip across and, and find other points. Okay? So if you ever asked for the axis of symmetry, it's x equals whatever the x coordinate of the vertex is. Okay? So if we want to graph one, we know A, we know whether it's going up or going down. We know H and K, so we know the vertex. But we need to know some other points so we can figure out what the how wide it is, you know, things like that. So we can determine these things by finding the x-intercepts, finding the y-intercepts. So just like with you know, your traditional linear equations, you can find the x-intercept by setting the equation equal to 0. So if we set f of x equal to 0, just set the equation equal to 0, then we get the, y, or the x-intercepts. If we set the x equal to 0, then we get the y-intercepts. There should only be one, right? Because it's a function. It can only have one y-intercept. And then when we plot all these points on a nice curve, it gives us our parabola. So we're going to try this. See how it works. So, if f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k. For this equation, what is A equal to? Negative 1. A is equal to negative 1. So is our parabola going to open up or down? down. It's going to open down. Okay. What is our H? Positive 1. So just like with our circles, since our original equation has a minus sign in it, we have to change the sign. So since this is minus 1, our h is going to become positive 1. And then what about k? Since the original equation has a plus sign, the sign is going to stay the same. So our k is just going to be 4. 
So that gives us the vertex of 1, 4. So that tells us where we're going to start. We know it opens down. But we don't know how wide it is. Okay? So we can do a couple of things. I'm going to show you how to do it using their method, then I'm going to show you the better way. But I want you, you have to be, be able to do it the, their way because the homework is going to ask you to find the x and y intercepts. So you want to make sure you can do it. But then I'm going to show you the proper way to actually graph parabolas. Okay? The easier way. So if we want to find the x intercept, then we say 0 equals negative x minus 1 squared plus 4. Just set the equation equal to 0. Now the easiest way to solve this equation, you could boil out the x minus 1, combine like terms, and then factor. But since we have a quantity squared, the easiest way to solve this is generally going to be to get all the numbers on one side, get the square term on one side, and take the square root of both sides. Okay, you remember doing this when you worked on square roots in Math 100? Okay, so that's what we're going to do for this one. We're going to start by subtracting 4 and get the number by itself on one side. We've got that square term over there, but it's a minus. Right, we got that minus sign out front, so how are we going to get rid of that? Distribute. Well, we can't distribute because it's being squared. Add one. We don't want to add because we're not really subtracting. What is that negative sign doing? Isn't that like saying negative one times in that multiplication? No. So really the, the way to get rid of it is going to be div divided out. Okay, so if we've got a minus sign, we can divide by negative one because then the minus signs will just cancel each other out. So that's going to give us positive 4 equals x minus 1 squared. Now I have a number and a squared term. Okay? So at this point I can just take the square root of both sides. So what do I get? What's the square root of 4? It's close. Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Right. Remember, anytime you take the square root, you're going to have to have a positive and a negative. Okay? And then what's the square root of x minus 1 squared? Remember, if you take the root of something squared, you just get the something. So it's just going to be x minus 1. That's the whole point of taking that square root is just to get rid of that square. And if you want one by its, or x by itself, now you can add one. So you're going to have plus or minus two plus one equals x. Now this represents two different values, right? Positive two plus one and negative two plus one. So I'm going to have 2 plus 1 equals x and negative 2 plus 1 equals x. So what are those two values? Negative 1 and 3. 3 and negative 1. And these will re represent the x coordinate or the yeah, the x coordinate of the x intercepts. Okay? Now, how do we find the y-intercepts? We just plug in x equals 0, right? You always plug in the opposite. If we're looking for y-intercepts, you plug in x equals 0. So, that's going to give us negative 0 minus 1 squared plus 4. Watch this negative sign. Make sure that minus sign stays out there. 
and make sure you do not distribute that minus sign into those parentheses at this point because that's a square term. You can't distribute that minus sign in there yet until you take care of that exponent. Remember your order of operations. Parentheses, exponents, then multiplication, division. Okay? So negative, negative 1 squared is positive 1. So negative 1 plus 4 gives us 3. So that's going to be the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. So now we want to graph We got the vertex at 1, 4. Right, we got the x intercepts at 3 and negative 1. And then we got a y intercept at 3. So we can see that basic shape taking form there and go ahead and connect the dots. Okay? Does that seem too bad? The hardest part is finding the x-intercept. Making sure that you can solve that equation. Now this is the way that the book wants you to do it. However, I'm about to show you a different way to do it. Actually, the easier way to do it would just be to do this. Discard. And start over. Okay. So, we already know that A equals negative 1 and our vertex is 1, 4. Right? So, a basic quadratic, x squared, okay, what, it's centered at zero, right? What do I get if I plug in x equals one? What's one squared? One. And since it's symmetric, it's also 1 on this side. What do I get if I plug in 2? So it goes up to 4 on both sides. What do I get if I plug in 3? 9. Okay. So what I want to think about is what the slope is between points. Okay. So what's the relationship between these sets of points? So from point... 1 to 2, what's the slope? Up 1 over 1. It's 1, right? What about from point 1 to point 2? We went up 3 over 1. So it has a slope of 3. Now from this point to the third point, fourth point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over 1. If we went to the next point, if we went from 9 to 16, it would be 7. 16 to 25, 9. 25 to 36, 11. You can see how it's, it's just odd numbers. It's increasing in an odd sequence. Okay? That's a basic x squared parabola. What's going to change these numbers is whatever a is. Okay? So if I multiply a by those numbers, I'll get the new sequence of slopes. Right? So for this equation, for this one, a equals negative 1, so my sequence of slopes will be 1 times negative 1, or negative 1, 3 times negative 1, negative 3, 5 times negative 1, negative 5. 
Okay? So when I go to graph it, one one four is my vertex. My first point is negative one slope, so down one over one, down one over one. From those points, I do my three. Down three over one, down three over one. From those points, I do the next slope, five. One, two, three, four, five over one. One, two, three, four, five over one. And I get the same parabola with a lot less work. And I actually can see what the x-intercepts are and then the y-intercepts. So some of them you can actually derive the x and y-intercepts without having to do any work. You can just plug them in, look at the slopes, and find those points. Okay? You will not see this in the book. You'll not see it in My Labs Plus, because I don't know if people don't teach this for some reason. But to me, this is just the easiest logical way to do parabolas. Okay? All right. So what would the axis of symmetry be for this parabola? x equals 1, right? It's always x equals whatever the x-coordinate of the vertex is. You can see it's the same on the left and the right. It's symmetric. All right. Now, that's all well and good when we've got parabolas in that standard form. But what about if they're in general form, which is how we see them more often than not? AX squared plus BX plus C. This is a general quadratic, right? This is what we're more used to seeing. If you're given a standard or a uh, general quadratic, then you can find the parabola by using the x-coordinate is negative b over 2a, and then take that x-coordinate and plug it in and solve for the y-coordinate. So f of negative b over 2a. Okay? If that doesn't make sense, we'll do it just so you can see it. And then you do the same thing. Find the x-intercept, the y-intercept, or, just like before, A, in this case, is still going to be that slope number, okay? You don't have to do anything different. A still is A, just like it was before. I'm going to change this one. I want to say negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 1. So in this case, what is A? What is B? Okay. C is 1, but really doesn't matter for this equation at this point. Now, if you want to find that x-intercept, you're going to have to use the quadratic equation, so you'd need to know A, B, and C. But so. Remember, the vertex is negative b over 2a, f of negative b over 2a. So let's find that x-coordinate, negative b over 2a. So what's negative b? Negative 4. And what's a? So that gives us, so that's just 1. Okay? That's good. That's the easy part. So how do we find the y-coordinate? 
we're just going to take that 1 and plug it back in to our equation. That's what f of means, right? We're going to do f of 1. And plug 1 back into f. So that's going to give us negative 2 times 1 squared plus 4 times 1 plus 1. So that'll just be negative 2 plus 4 plus 1, which is going to give us 3. Okay? Everybody good with how I did that? Finding negative b over 2a and then taking that number and just plugging it back into the original equation, that's going to give you your y coordinate. So this gives me an x and a y. That is my vertex, 1, 3. So we want to talk about the slope progression. The slope progression is normally 1, 3, 5, right? The odd numbers. But we need to multiply it by A. So A is negative 2. So we get negative 2, negative 6, and negative 10. So those are our new slope progressions, okay? So when we graph this, we go to our vertex, one, three, one, one, two, three. And then we use negative 2 to find our next points. Down 2 over 1. Down 2 over 1. Okay, so that gave us these points. Then we use negative 6 to find our next point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over 1. And then negative 10 to find the next. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 over 1, 10 over 1. So we get that graph. You just always plug in those odd numbers whenever you're finding them. Mm -hmm. It always starts with 135. And then you just multiply it by A to get the new progression. By A. Since A was negative 2 here, that's why we multiplied by negative 2. I like this method better is because with this problem, if you solve for the x-intercepts, you don't get a whole number. You get a square root. You get a weird decimal. And I, I don't want to graph weird decimals. Okay? I don't want y'all to have to graph weird decimals. Like, where is 4.28372? I don't know. It's somewhere in here. It's just your best guess, right? When you've got a nice drawn out graph, it's very easy to see where 1, 3 is. Okay? That's no problem. Finding 0 0.2 is a little trickier. Okay? See, on their problem, when they found the x-intercepts, They get negative 0.2 and 4.2 roughly. It's the roughly I have I take umbrage with. Okay. With my way, you get exact values for every point.
Now, one thing that we want to talk about is maximum and minimums, because this is really the crux of quadratic equations, what we use them for. Uh, there are different ways to do maximum minimum problems once you get to calculus, but at the pre-calculus level, quadratics are really the, the, the ones we can deal with with maximum and minimum problems. So think about this. If you've got a parabola that's opening up Where is its minimum going to be? It's going to be at the vertex, right? It can't go lower than that. But it has to be its minimum. And if you've got one that's opening down, where is its maximum? At the vertex. So this tells us that if A is positive, I'm going to have a minimum because it's opening up. That tells me I'm guaranteed to have a minimum. If A is negative and it's opening down, I'm guaranteed to have a maximum. Okay? And it happens at the vertex. That's all that says. So looking at this equation, 4x squared minus 16x plus 1,000, does it have a maximum or a minimum? Why? Because A is positive. Because A is positive, so it's opening up, therefore it has to have a minimum. Okay? If I know nothing else, I know that this is looking like this, therefore it has to have a minimum. But I should be able to solve for that value, right? Because I can find the vertex. So, where is the vertex of this one? How do I find the vertex? Negative b over 2a and then f, f of negative b over 2a. So the x coordinate is going to be what's a here? Well, b is negative 16. What's a? 4 and c is 1,000. So this is going to be negative b, which is positive 16, 2 times a, 2 times 4. Jumping ahead of myself there. So 16 over 8, or 2. So we're going to have a value of 2 for our x. And then we're going to take that x, plug it back in to get our y. Okay? So 2 squared gives us 4. 16 times 2 gives us 32. So 16 minus 32 plus 1,000. Negative 16 <coughs> plus 1,000. 984. So our vertex. And this is what you're generally going to see with quadratics. The first number tends to be a smaller number. The second number tends to be a bigger number. We tend to use quadratics to model, a lot of times you see it with like cost functions and revenue functions, profit functions. So the, maybe the, this function might model, you know, x represents how many widgets you're creating and the function represents how much money you make. So the more widgets you make generally, the more money you make. So what's the minimum amount of money you're going to make? The minimum amount of money you would make would be $984 when you make two widgets. If you made one widget, you'd actually make more money than if you made two. So it's a little weird, but it's not a very good. I don't think real cost functions and profit functions would look like that or act like that, but uh, we, we're saying that it will. So 
So if we look at this, just by looking at that and knowing that that has a minimum value at 2, 8, uh, 984. So the vertex is 2, 984. What would the domain of this function be? What are my x values that I can have? Is there any restriction on x? Do I have any fractions? Do I have any square roots? Anything at all? No? So my domain is just all reals, right? So that's an important statement. For a quadratic function, the domain is always all real numbers. Okay? Forever and always. What about the range now? Remember, range is the y values. So what would the range for this one be knowing that the minimum occurs at 984? 984 to infinity, right? You always start at the smallest and go to the biggest. So we're going to start at the minimum. Is it going to include it or not include it? Well, it's a parabola, so the vertex is actually included, right? So you would actually include it. Now, if anybody goes and looks at these PowerPoints and uses them to study it all, they have it wrong. They put a parenthesis. Bad Pearson. Okay, so that should be a bracket though, because it does include 984. So here we have a strategy for solving problems involving maximizing and minimizing. The first step, not just for maximizing and minimizing problems, but for any word problem, read it. Read it again. Read it a third time. Make sure you understand what it's asking. What quantity are you asking to be maximized and minimized in this case? Make sure you understand what's being asked. So for maximum and minimum problems, the second step is to use the conditions of the problems to isolate whatever you're maximizing or minimizing into one variable. Because you always want to be able to solve one equation with one variable. But if you've got one equation with two variables, you can't solve it. Okay? You need one equation, one variable. And then once you've got it in terms of one variable, you should have it as a quadratic, and you want to write it in descending order so it's in general form, ax squared plus bx plus c. And then find its vertex using negative b over 2a, f of negative b over 2a, and that'll determine what the maximum or minimum is. Okay? So here's your problem. Say you're a rancher. Your neighbor down the road gives you 120 feet of fencing. And you've decided you need to set up a <coughs> rectangular pen for your cow. And you want to know what's the biggest area that I can enclose in a rectangular formation so that my cow has the most grass to eat. Okay? So we're limiting it to just a rectangle because it gets a little bit more wonky when you start adding different shapes. But this is the assumption. So I want to maximize the area. So that tells me I'm going to have to use an area formula. So what's the formula for an area of a rectangle? L w length times width. So three loser? What? I don't know. <laughs> length times width. Okay. Now, notice this is one equation, but it's got two variables, length and width. Yeah, I can't solve that. I can't do anything with it. So I need to figure out a way to get either length in term of width or width in terms of length so that I only have one variable. So I go back to my problem and I say, well, what other information do I have? Well, I've got that I have 120 feet of fencing. Well, that would be the total perimeter around my rectangle, right? That's how much total fencing I have. So I know that in a rectangle, if I've got length 
that's length, that's width, and that's width. So the perimeter is 2L plus 2W. Okay? Well, I'm given that my perimeter is going to be 120 feet. I'm going to factor a 2 out, divide by 2, and I get length plus width equals 60. Okay? Now I've got two equations. Area equals, area equals length times width, and 60 equals length plus width. So I've got two equations with two unknowns. You remember doing systems of equations in 100? As long as you've got two equations and two unknowns, you can solve an equation. Okay, you can solve a system. What we're going to do is we're going to use substitution. We're going to get L in terms of W or W in terms of L and plug it in over here. So, do I want to get L by itself or W by itself? L, every, every class has chosen L. I don't know why. So, we're going to subtract W, subtract W. I get L equals 60 minus W. So I can take that and plug that into my area equation as L. So that'll give me 60 minus W times W. Right? That's just length times width. So what's that going to be? 60W minus W squared. So I want to rewrite it in descending order so that the square term is first. So negative W squared plus 60W. So it's quadratic now, right? So I know that my maximum, since it's a negative, I know it's going down and has a maximum can be found at the vertex. So what's the vertex? Negative b over 2a, f of negative b over 2a, right? So the x coordinate, which is negative b over 2a, is going to be what? What's negative b? Negative 60. What's 2 times negative 1? negative 2. So what's negative 60 divided by negative 2? 30. 30. So my x coordinate is 30. So that gives me my optimized or my maximized w. That gave me the maximum w for my maximum area. Okay? So the first question was to find the dimensions that maximize the enclosed area. So I know that if x equals 30, that means w equals 30 at the maximum value. So I can come back over here and solve for L. So what's 60 minus 30 for L? So the dimensions are 30 by 30. And this teaches an, an important lesson to us. A square is an optimized rectangle. I had one person want to argue with me in one class, like, square is not a rectangle. A square is a rectangle. It's just a rectangle that's length and width are equal to each other. Okay? And it is optimized. Your maximums and minimums will always happen in squares given four sides. Okay? So, you can do two things at this point. You can either plug 30 in to your original equation to get that maximized area, or since you know what the dimensions are, you can just do length times width, either one. You should get the same answer either way. So let's do it the right way. Let's plug in x back into our equation. So area equals negative 30 squared plus 60 times 30. So what's 30 squared? 900. 60 times 30, 1,800. So negative 900 plus 1,800 is 900 square feet. What's 30 times 30? Still 900. So either way you do it, you're still going to get the same answer. Okay? 
Is that super, super complicated? I don't think so. I think that's not too bad. We could do it with calculus too, though. That's more fun. Y'all want to do it with calculus? I'm not going to do it with calculus. It's actually much easier, though. I'm not going to lie to you. What all classes do you teach? Uh, I can teach everything. It's just it kind of depends on the semester, what they need me to do. Since I'm low man on the totem pole, it's like what nobody else wants, I guess. But right now I'm teaching this trig and calculus. All right. Any questions on maximizing? And the problem with maximizing and minimizing area and things like that is there's so many different ways you can do these problems or how they can be set up. Not, not, there's only one way to do them. There are different ways to set them up. Okay? So do the problems. Uh, make sure you understand what it's asking. Make sure you can set them up properly. If you have any problems with them, make sure and ask me about them. Send me an email, send me a remind, use the ask an instructor, uh, call my office, uh, you know, smoke signals. There's you know, an infinite, way, infinite number of ways to get a hold of me. Okay? Uh, that's really all we have. Uh, the sheet that I gave you, important. Notice that there are 12 problems on this sheet. I want you to do this worksheet and bring it back Tuesday. For every problem that you get right, I will give you a half a point on your next test. So this is bonus points for your next test. So you get a total of six, so you get a total of six if you get all of them right. They have to be completely right, and because these are nice, neat graphs, I expect you to actually plot the points correctly, and I should be able to see where the points are. Now, if you do the method of x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and you get x-intercepts that are fractional, decimal, yada, yada, yadas, make sure you denote that this point is 0 0.13, this point is negative point, you know, give me the actual value so that I can see what you're doing, as opposed to just taking your word for it. Okay? Any questions? Did I call a roll? Of course I didn't.